number one. We're uh, changing the order a little bit. I'm Tanya Tichkoski from the University of Toronto. Really happy to be here. Uh, we have access copies for our, our panel members, but just a couple on Canadian paper. <laughs> so I'd like to give it away to you. It's not worth as much as yeah. Okay, we're not quite settled, but I think I better get going. Thanks for all the organizers and for everybody's energy and time and focus. We have um, three papers in this panel. Uh, the order is going to move from a uh, sighted person's perspective or sighted embodiment with myself. Uh, my paper is called Stimulating Normalcy, Simulating Imagination. Then we're moving to Devin Healy, PhD student from the University of Toronto, uh, taking a, a perspective of legal blindness. And her paper is called the hashtag how I see it campaign. And finally, concluding with profound blindness, as Lynn Manning would say, Rod McCalco, and uh, from, well, retired from the University of Toronto, and now short story writer par excellence. Um, his paper is called the stimulation of simulation. So I'm going to just get going here. What the three of us will try to do here is to explore the phenomenon of simulation in relation to disability as it appears in fundraising campaigns, everyday interactions, and educational awareness programs. Simulation is inexorably tied to knowledge, particularly its acquisition. It is also typically understood as a solution to the problems of curiosity, wonder, of disbelief, and even of fear. People often say that they wish to know what's it like to do this or that? What's it like to be this way or that? What's it like to be disabled? Is a question that often stimulates the simulation of disability and includes activities such as sit in a wheelchair for a while, Put on a blindfold for an hour or a minute. Put in earplugs. These activities supposedly provide an opportunity for non-disabled people to find out what's it like. We are oriented, this panel's oriented to a different question. What sort of knowledge does simulation stimulate? Each of our papers will uh, try to show the kind of knowledge that the simulation of disability produces while also showing how simulation is a social act that covers over the assumptions behind its own production. We seek to remove the veil that is drawn over the knowledge generated by simulation, thereby revealing versions of the human imaginary that grounds disability as a noble thing via non-disabilities simulation of it. Everybody comfortable now? Here, uh, that's our panel, and here I go on my take on this. Simulation, unlike copying, is interesting for the ways in which it locates and activates its authority. When we copy, we engage in an act of mimesis, where what is supposed to be authoritative is that which we copy. A good copy, or reproduction, is the one that gets closest to being just like its inspiration. Its target is replication. A copy tries to be com as completely similar as is possible. And while the time-space continuum of human existence makes an exact copy or replica absolutely impossible, we could imagine that that is the aim of making a copy. Not so with simulation. A simulation from the get-go does not want to be a replication. It is knowingly oriented to not being exactly the same as that which it represents. It's a partial representation, and in that way it aims to be an incomplete copy of that which it imitates. At the same time, however, at least in educational endeavors, a good simulation aims to take some part in or repeat a part of an experience, and this part is supposed to stand in for the whole. An educationally organized simulation needs to be selectively partial. If it is to provide those undergoing the simulation some sense of fidelity to an event or an experience. 
It's in these ways that we can begin to make sense of Jean Baudrillard saying in his book, Simulation, and here's, I'm gonna come back to this quote a couple times, and I find it tricky, but here's the first time. Quote, to dissimulate is to feign not to have what one has. To simulate is to feign to have what one hasn't. One implies a presence, the other an absence, end quote. In disability awareness training programs, for example, simulations simulate what one hasn't, namely an impairment. Impairment is feigned since it is absent, thus the earplugs, the blindfolds, or the leg and arm restrictions that are put on. Being non-disabled is implied even while some aspect of impairment is being represented. <laughs> put this way, it seems a bit strange that this is supposed to be an educative moment. And perhaps the question should be, educating who about what? Nonetheless, disability simulations as found on Western University campuses in games of trust, or as we'll hear from Devin and Rod in fundraising campaigns and in imaginations of worst case scenarios, are not like tricks that try to feign a presence so as to, for example, gain an advantage by presenting oneself as possessing an impairment. Instead, simulation is to feign exactly what one doesn't have, doesn't possess. A good disability simulation, if there is such a thing, in Baudrillard's terms, is one that announces or at least provides a clear representation, even a proclamation. I am not that which I am feigning to be. I am the absence of disability while I am simultaneously simulating its presence. Again, what sort of learning might this be? Here are a few more examples from uh, Silverman's 2015 article, The Perils of Playing Blind, that might help us think about the question of simulation as providing an odd education. Quote, in a banquet hall, the lights are turned out and attendees struggle to serve themselves a meal in the dark. Sponsored by a fundraising organization, this dinner culminates in an appeal for donations to support medical research on the elimination of blindness. Meanwhile, at a Girl Scout camp, children are paired off, and one child of each pair closes her eyes, while her partner leads her about. The exercise is intended to help the Girl Scouts build trust and learn how to depend on one another for help. Still the quotation. Finally, in a classroom, Blindness professional trainees wear low vision simulator goggles. They are asked to walk from one side of the table to the other, a task they find daunting. All of these are examples of blindness simulations critiqued by blindness activists." End quote. Funds can be raised through learning about struggling to function blind. Blindness simulations teach groups of children about dependence. The difficulty of moving without vision might teach those who teach orientation and mobility skills to be more empathetic to their blind learners. The assumed educative prowess of blindness simulations relies on some sort of hidden authority, and uncovering this authority might have yet some more lessons for us. Blocked sight animates the simulation. That is, the authority of sight is prevalent throughout all of these simulations. Note that it is merely by mechanically blocking seeing eyes from looking that we are said to be engaged in the, um, in the simulation of blindness. Closed eyelids or blocked vision as the simulation of blindness makes sight the authoritative figure and blindness simulations teach us that it is bad news to mess with sight. And um, my colleagues had suggested I should tell, call my paper The Bad News of Messing with Sight. <laughs> Closed, um, sorry. Consider, for example, what is taught by the eyelids shut, be led about by a fellow Girl Scout, Scout, and thereby experience trust or dependency. What's taught by that simulation? First and foremost, it teaches that sight is the preferred leader and that sight is so naturalized as such that sighted people seem not to even need a lesson to trust or depend on their eyes. And this belief holds despite, despite years of training to watch out, look both ways, 
or the most recent, see it, say it, sort it. That's, that's the train stations here. Moreover, while the Girl Scout may not come to learn what it means to be dependent on their eyes as their taken for granted leader, they will learn that blocking their capacity to look throws them into a different relationship with others, one that does not seem natural, natural nor taken for granted. The Girl Scout is to learn to trust another to lead her around, and the leading other is to learn that the blindfolded scout will count on her for guidance. Now, once blindfolded and led about and trusting, or not, their sighted guide, the authority of sight will once again override all the difficult forms of knowing that could come through the authority of blindness. Ways of knowing, such as how to negotiate interdependency when not only, does, not only doesn't one see the space, the table, the dinner, but also doesn't see one's comrade in these spaces and in the midst of the movement of air and smell and sounds and in the play of interactual rituals and everyday routines. So caught is blindness simulation and the authority of sight that the form of learning that might come from blindness is not an imagined part of the simulation. Blindness simulations teach that by blocking sight and then doing things, the non-disabled participant is put more directly in touch with the powerful authority of sight to organize an ordinary or normal sense of being in the world. I think the lessons might even end here since it is likely that the blindness simulation relies strictly on the presence of the absence of sight and so much so that it cannot dwell on the movement between the absence of sight as a naturalized leader to the presence of some other authority that might lead. I think it's, it is just such a movement that is stimulated in Rod's uh, book, The Two-in-One, Walking with Smokey, Walking with Blindness where he talks about his search for a guide as he became more blind. Quote, this is from Rod. The form a guide will take depends on how blindness is conceived. A blind person's search for a guide, then, is always conducted in a social order that understands eyesight as the natural guide. As such, it becomes a search for something that will replace nature. End quote. In Rod's account, Blindness is not merely the absence of sight. It is also the experience of sight as not a guide, nor as natural, and not even as the sole authority. The difficulties of doing things when engaged in blocking a person from looking, that is, where blindness is feigned, provides for a partial and incomplete experience to stand in for and authorize sight, where sight leads us toward a definition of blindness as simply not seeing. Sight is the authority, and it lets people know that we are, we, I mean sighted pretenders, are living a replicated reality that is but partial, and living it enough that we get the stimulating sense of the simulation. We get a blindness experience that reminds us of the normalcy of taking sight for granted and having this taken for grantedness act as if it is a natural leader. Still, we might return once more to Jean Baudrillard's discussion of simulation to see if there's yet one more lesson in these disability simulations. So recall, he says, quote, to dissimulate is to feign not to have what one has. To simulate is to feign to have what one hasn't. One implies a presence, the other an absence, end quote. Insofar as the blindness simulation makes present the powerful authority of sight to organize the ordinary sense of being in the world and doing things, how is this still feigning to have what one hasn't? How are we not strictly and straightforwardly implying not an absence, but instead the presence of the authority of sight? Has something other than looking been made absent in the simulation of blindness? What I am feigning to have that I don't have, what am I feigning to have, sorry, that I don't have when I simulate blindness? Those who simulate blindness are living announcements. They say, I have sight. It is authoritative. I have sight as the definition of the situation. 
I have cite as the authoritative definition of the situation that all that blindness is, is the lack of such definitional power. What then is the sighted person feigning? They are, and maybe all sighted people are, feigning that sight's authoritative power is natural. The persistence of vision lies in the power we give it to make us, sighted people, forget that we have formed cultural relations to looking. Or as McKelko and Healy are about to show us, looking is cultural through and through. Further, to look at blindness as if it is nothing but the absence of sight is to feign a mythical certainty. After all, we have formed cultural relations to the way we look at disability, indigeneity, race, class, gender, sexuality, and all else that appears to matter, as if these matters are given to us by the nature of sight and not by the context of culture. We feign the possession of nature, and these manifest manners involved in simulation, as Gerald Weisner might say, are, quote, the simulations of bourgeois decadence and melancholy, end quote. Still, this simulation of sight, as if a natural power, leads ironically, surprisingly, and perhaps tentatively to an imaginative possibility. At the point of the realization that I am not feigning blindness, but rather feigning the naturalness of the power of sight, it is possible that the simulation might flip into dissimulation, since I may for a moment lose touch with sight as all-powerful. I might experience what I no longer have when I simulate blindness, namely a naturalized or decultured experience of sight. I might even begin to consider more imaginative relations between sight and blindness, or even to simulate the dominant orientations that hold that sight or any other human capacity is given by nature and not by collective life. Thank you. And now for Devin Healy and the hashtag How I See It campaign. Oh, there's good morning. Cards. Oh, there's cards. Do you have coffee, Sarnia? Oh, I do, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Sarnia. Good morning. Um, so my name is Devin Healy, and I have to say I am beyond thrilled to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. So gosh, what, what's it like to be blind? I, I just can't imagine it. Close your eyes and walk around the room. Whoa, my eyes keep opening every time I'm unsure. Try this blindfold. That's it, now walk. Ouch! Imagine blindness. Imagine what you cannot see or what you do not know. This unseeable and unknown, the blind sights of the capital I, stimulates simulation of blindness. How I see becomes the desired knowledge of the I. What's it like? And this removes any sight that blindness may have had. The I simulates not blindness, but no sight. And blindness remains what it was always like, the absence of sight. Seeing and knowing are two very different things, and yet seeing has become synonymous with knowing. The pairing of sight and knowledge gives way to yet another odd match, one that again brings two very different things together, blindness and nothing, <laughs> absence. To see nothing for the sighted person, one who possesses biological eyes, eyes with the function to see, is a scary thing, one to be avoided at all costs. Nothing to a sighted person is an, unimaginable, is an unimaginable existence, an existence that in no way could nurture existence at all. And yet, blindness is among us. The Foundation Fighting Blindness and their 2016 social media hashtag how, capital E-Y-E, how I see it, campaign, a request for biological eyes to blindfold themselves, simulating blindness in order to, quote, raise awareness and funds for retinal degenerative disease research, end quote, is one example of how biological eyes simulating blindness is caught up in an unimaginable imaginary. 
This imaginary is not very imaginative at all. Today, I want to begin to unveil the implications of such a campaign, not only for sightedness and blindness, but for the human imagination. I will talk about the hashtag How I See a campaign in order to reveal the current imaginings of blindness and how these imaginings are fastened not only to, but over blind people. So now here we go, I promise. <laughs> The fundraising campaign aims at demonstrating, quote, the difficulty in performing everyday tasks with vision impairment or loss, end quote, by pairing sighted persons with a low vision blind partner. These ambassadors, after speaking with their blind partner, post a short video on social media of themselves performing a task associated with their identity category, celebrity, athlete, chef, teacher, parent. The hope is to highlight how, when blindfolded, the capacity to do is taken away. These ambassadors become disabled, their skills lost or weakened. The campaign frames their rationale in statistical terms, tacitly claiming that statistics are self-evident facts and are not part of culture. The campaign does, ironically, make use of what they understand as culture in the form of celebrities, fear of blindness, and the desire for cure. The announcement states that, quote, more than 10 million Americans and millions more worldwide are affected by retinal degenerative diseases, end quote, locating an issue that is both large in numbers, numbers representing people, lives, eyes, productivity, and one that is widespread and growing. More eye-opening than this is the cultural rationale, quote, yet blindness is far more broadly impactful. A recent study from JAMA Ophthalmology showed Americans rank losing eyesight as the worst thing that could happen to them when ranked against other conditions, including loss of a limb, memory, hearing, or speech, end quote. There is a sense of fear that statistically, blindness is growing, expanding, and it could be coming for you. A way to rid yourself of this threat, according to the campaign, is to put your money where your eyes are. The initiative will come to a close on, quote, World Sight Day, October 13th, 2016, end quote. Not December 3rd, nothing to do with disability. It is interesting how the awareness is spread by calling out three friends not only to imagine, but also simulate their worst fear, being blind. The fact that this initiative ends on World Sight Day highlights that the awareness being raised is not that of blindness, but rather the valuable at-risk key to life, sight. Keeping with this risk theme, the campaign says that they are, quote, fighting blindness, end quote, thus orienting the sighted reader to approach, conceptualize, and or imagine blindness with caution and fear. Fighting blindness suggests that there is a threat, an attack that has been launched against the sighted, healthy seeing eye, the enemy, blindness. The ING at the end of fight also hints to the sighted reader that this fight is not new, but one that is in progress, suggesting that we have become engaged in this fight for quite some time. The question is, of what should we be aware? Be aware your sight is at risk. Don't end up like these people. The relationship between foundation charity and blindness implies that there are victims, casualties that have been left behind or created in this fight, people of blindness or blind people. The call to raise awareness and money surrounds blindness and its people in a veil of lack, limit, loss, tragedy, and need, in need of money and sighted attention. This need creates the impression that this fight, long waging, has almost been forgotten or ignored, and that blindness in the form of, quote, retinal degenerative diseases, end quote, may be winning, and that attention, sighted attention, is needed. Persons of blindness are used as warning signs to grab the attention of sighted eyes, using their experiences of everyday life, hashtag how I see it, as examples as to why research must be done. This research does not suggest that it is intended for eyes already blind, but rather sighted eyes. Blindness is, after all, the end of sight, no longer in need of research, it's too late. Research is intended for sighted people. 
It is a fight that protects people from blindness by sustaining the freedom of sight. It is a fight for freedom. Blindness is the casualty of this fight. The blind person is not imagined as an active agent in this fight, but rather is imagined as a casualty. Blindness is treated as a warning for fearful, forgetful eyes. This warning is framed by the campaign as the difficulty of a life of blindness. The initiative pairs, quote, some individuals with retinal degenerative diseases, end quote, with ambassadors to show, perhaps warn, the difficulty in performing everyday tasks with vision impairment or loss. The everyday of blindness is interpreted to be <laughs> difficult in the performance of tasks. Blindness is, in this campaign, innately hard, difficult to do life. And this difficulty is juxtaposed with individuals who are seen to excel at doing life, namely celebrity. The campaign locates success, achievement, and wealth, for the most part, in eyes that see. The blindfold challenge demonstrates a specific conception imaginary of blindness as one that is and one that robs the individual of the ability to do life and the ability to be fully human. Since the human imaginary of this campaign is steeped in the human doing rather in a non-utilitarian version of humanity. When the sighted ambassadors of this campaign are blindfolded, immersed in complete darkness, a popular imaginary of blindness, their ability to do is taken away, attributing their success, achievement, and wealth not to them, but to the wholeness of being replete with and imagined as eyes that work. This is a powerful image that makes blindness mean the absence of potential to do life and thus to live. This imaginary does not allow for persons of blindness to know themselves or their eyes outside of sight and its desires and fears. Blindness becomes an identity imagined as the worst thing possible. Recall that JAMA ophthalmology said that Americans fear blindness more than anything else even more than death. Despite the fact that the human imaginary of blindness is, as this campaign suggests, quite bleak, science must enter into the imaginary to confirm this. This, in science's eyes, is not, name, is not only human perception, imaginary, it is fact. Science's imaginary is logic, an intimacy it shares with common sense. Science removes the person from blindness. Eyes become something to be watched as unpredictable, a source of fear. If they eyes were seen as part of a person, then we would have to take into account the reality of that person. Blindness would not only be darkness or lack of doing, but rather a different way of doing, a difference that society would have to account for or respond to, and that would take too much. Would this create a social media buzz? And would funds be raised? Would this version of blindness be simulated? Not likely. It is easy for the human imaginary to remove the person and isolate the problem in a part of the body. Attack that, divide, and conquer. What's conquered? The body. The creation of normalcy through our interpretive relationship with each other is held up as what ought to be. When we experience blindness, a physical phenomenon that has always been, I mean, its appearance is not new, Blindness is seen as what is out of place and not our reaction response to it. We use science as a way to fight against the disabled body, mind, senses, to prove that the sighted way, normalcy, is the right way, and anything else is a problem. Imagine you were the worst thing that could happen. Imagine what it would be like knowing that people would rather be anything than you. Imagine ranking disabilities, ranking lives in order of desirability. How did we come to such a reductive imaginary? How did blindness engage in such intimacy with darkness? Darkness of the blindfold, darkness of the future, darkness of the imagination. How did blindness and its intimacy with darkness become absence? Recall the excitement expressed at the launch of this campaign. Recall the excitement towards celebrities, athletes, and business icons for taking the blindfold challenge. Recall the ways in which blindness became the enemy and its people the casualties of war. 
This excitement is generated from the possibility of beating the body, halting the appearance of difference that would in any way question the bioeconomic man as natural. The excitement of beating blindness may reflect our need to transcend the body, elevating ourselves above nature and into the realm of knowing beyond what is given to us, our bodies. To such transcendence, blindness is an obstacle. Blindness does not kill people, it kills eyes, leaving behind a body that does not represent a knowing power, but an unknown, something that we could not stop or control. Eyes die, but people continue to live, not fully human, not living a worthwhile life, but alive nonetheless. Blindness's intimacy with darkness and thus absence is the representation that we may not be as powerful as we think, want, and know ourselves to be. To vilify blindness as something we can overtake and to vilify its people as not quite human allows for the possibility that you, the sighted, may still transcend the body. Is it this obstacle to transcendence that we simulate when we simulate blindness? Thank you very much. And, oh, I left my glasses behind. Oh. <laughs> you, don't, you don't own my name? <laughs> yes, I know you did. <laughs> Here comes Rod McElko to the, uh, it's not a still. Still? What's this called? Podium. <laughs> ah, Canadians. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, uh, David Bolt, and all the organizers for uh, this is an excellent, excellent conference. This is, I think, our, our my my, sorry, my third time here, so it's been great. Um, uh, all the quotations I'm going to be using from Lynn, the late Lynn Manning come from his play Weights. So I just want to tell you that to begin with. And uh, speaking of Lynn Manning, it used to be when he and I, when I had the, the, I mean, the honor of doing uh, you know, a couple of gigs with him here and there. We both use this kind of a device, which is sticking this thing in your ear and then repeating what's on here. And we used to compete to see who would, like, as he so eloquently put it, who would screw up. And um, <laughs> I never did win those. Boy, David is right. This is a tough room. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anybody left here? Yeah? Just, OK, great. Right, I also have access copies if anybody. I'm just interested. Yeah, sure. OK. All right, I'm going to give this a shot. Thank you. What's... <laughs> I already choked. <laughs> I just better hang on to this. <laughs> what stimulates us to simulate? This question has haunted me for quite some time, particularly as it relates to disability. I'm often asked, What's it like being blind? Is it all dark? Can you see anything? Sometimes people tell me that they try to imagine what my blindness is like by simulating it. I will try to unravel what compels us to simulate. Asking what's it like requires, first of all, that we neither have the it of which we ask, nor are we it. After all, if we were it, or had it, we wouldn't need to ask what it's like to be or have it. <laughs> it seems then that simulation is stimulated by difference. We can only ask what it's like if the it is different from us. No difference, no stimulation to simulate. What sort of difference stimulates simulation? Anticipating something or even fearing its occurrence is one of those occasions that may stimulate us to simulate. In his autobiographical play, Waits, blind playwright, poet, and performer, the late Min Manning, tells of how his blindness came about. At age 23, and while in a local bar celebrating his acquiring a new job, Manning was shot in the head during a bar fight a shot that blinded him. Traumatic as this event was though, it was not the first time that Manning had thought about blindness. 
he was a young as aspiring painter and he often applied Murphy's Law suggesting that what could go wrong would go wrong. Blindness, he thought, was the worst possible thing that could go wrong for a painter. Manning, of course, had heard of blind person doing some pretty incredible things, but painting was definitely not one of them. That's a quote. He thought if Murphy's Law prevailed that he would switch from painting on canvas to creating artworks with words. So Manning began to prepare for blindness. Quote, I began secretly doing everyday tasks in the dark with my eyes closed, dialing the phone, tying my shoes, washing the dishes. I had been determined that blindness would not catch me off guard, end quote. A painter anticipating blindness, this could stimulate simulation. And for Lynn Manning, it did. It is interesting though, that Manning's simulation of blindness did not involve wondering what it was like. He already knew. It was like dialing a phone, tying shoes, or washing dishes in the dark, or with eyes closed. That's what blindness was like. Darkness, it was like doing things with your eyes closed. Simulating it is easy, just shut the lights or close your eyes. As it turned out though, lights out or eyes closed did not prove to be the real blind thing for Manning. Shifting geometric shapes and colors did. Still, what stimulated Manning's need to simulate blindness? was the idea that of preparing for the worst, waiting for Murphy's Law to enact itself. Sorry. This, as is the case for all of us, Manning simulated what he took blindness to be, his own version of it, and the origin of not only Manning's, but anyone's version of blindness is culture culture, and sighted culture at that, provide the simulation, stimulation for simulation, sorry. Manning's simulation of blindness is akin to many versions of simulation generated by a sense of preparation. Still, we often simulate experiences that we are not preparing for and that we hope will not befall us. There are those we do not want to be we know what it feels like to be those people that we don't want to be. And this situation provokes a different kind of st stimulation, yielding a different kind of simulation. Fundraising campaigns on behalf of disability are a common feature of our society that date back many years. More often than not, these campaigns are organized to raise funds for the elimination of whatever disability the particular campaign seeks to eradicate. One such campaign, as Devin spoke of, is a How I See It campaign, telling the truth about blindness. The aim of this campaign is to eliminate blindness, and part of its strategy is to simulate blindness by doing everyday activities in under blindfolds. The National Federation of the Blind takes exception with this particular uh, exception of blindness. Quote, the current videos being circulated with the hashtag I, how I see it campaign is perpetuating the idea that blindness is something to be feared and that blind people adhere to low expectations. One of the tasks people are encouraged to do in this campaign is to is to have a friend give them an unidentified amount of cash and then under blindfolds attempt to pay for a meal with this money. Another particularly outrageous example is people are asked to attempt to look after their children for one minute while blindfolded, end quote. Ignoring the outrageous character of such a campaign for the moment, let us look at some of the similarities between this campaign's Stimulate, stimulation to simulate blindness 
and that of Lynn Manning. First, both simulate blindness by doing things, the latter in the dark or with eyes closed, and the former under blindfolds. Second, both simulations are conducted by sighted people. The most striking similarity, though, is that they imagine what's it like to be blind and that stimulated to do so with the understanding that the that the and that blindness is something to be feared, feared in the face of the necessity to do things, both of the everyday variety, tying shoes, paying for a meal, and of the extraordinary painting, taking care of children. Both the campaign and Lynn Manning simulate blindness with the sense of, what if I were to go blind? And here is where the similarity ends. The NFB criticizes the hashtag how I see it campaign strategy of stimulating, simulating blindness. Simulating blindness, says the NFB, plays on the already existing fear of blindness that circulates in our culture and indeed enhances that fear. Most strikingly, it criticizes simulation exercises for their inability to imagine life blind. It is one thing to count money or to tie shoes under blindfolds, and quite another, to imagine painting or caring for children, even for a minute, never mind a lifetime. The point is that doing things blind and simulating blindness are two entirely different activities. They acquire a familiarity only when blindness is understood as the lack of sight, resulting in the understanding that blind people are sighted people with the sight missing. Perhaps the least imaginative way to conceive of blindness is as the lack of sight. And as a corollary, the least imaginative way to conceive of blind people is as those who are without sight, as a sighted person with the sight missing, as sight without itself. And what is sight without itself, if not inability, incapacity, a diminished self, a self that misses itself. Moreover, sight is conceived of as natural phenomenon and is often conceived of as a gift either from nature or from the divine. Can there be anything more horrific than the lack of such a gift or the possibility of losing one? Can there be anything more scary than this? This is precisely the version of blindness that stimulates simulation. What's it like is transformed by simulation into something akin to experiencing what we already know, to experiencing, but only for a moment, the horror that we know blindness to be. This version of simulation resembles a reminder. This reminder is threefold. First, Simulating blindness reminds us of what a precious gift sight is. Second, it is a reminder that we take this precious gift for granted and ought not to. And finally, it reminds us, what was that? Oh, it's not a fire alarm. <laughs> you let me know, right? <laughs> It reminds us that there are those that are less fortunate than ourselves who, who do not have the precious gift of sight. Simulation is a reminder, a momentary one, but a reminder of what we know life without the gift of sight to be. Sight as a gift not given. The worthwhileness of sight with itself or life with sight, is found in the gift of instrumentality. This provides the instrument of capacity. It provides the special gift of the instrument for knowing. It is the basis for the gift of knowledge. 
within this version of a worthwhile life, sight without itself, or life with blindness, is not a worthwhile life. It is not a life to be cherished. It is not a life that provides the precious gift of instrumentality. There is no ability or capacity in sight without itself, nor is there knowing or knowledge. Since the instrument required for all of these is absent, lacking, it has gone missing. And this is what simulation depends upon for its existence. It reminds us of the precious gift of sight, of the horror of blindness, and it does so by, by confirming what we already know. Confirmation comes to us under blindfolds. What we learn when we are under blindfolds is that such an experience ha has the horror of the lack of instrumentality and that we can fling the blindfolds from our sight in a heartbeat. And this too reminds us of the special gift of sight with itself. But what did Le Manning learn from simulation? Was his version of simulation remind us of anything? What does simulating blindness do for Lynn Manning when lights can no longer be turned on and when open eyes are no longer the opening of sight? Recall that Manning's simulation of blindness was stimulated by preparation. With Murphy's Law held, and if what could go wrong for a painter would, blindness was, according to Manning, the worst thing that could happen. And it did. But what happened was not what Lynn Manning had prepared for. Rather than darkness, blindness brought colors and geometric shapes to Manning. He had not prepared for this. Manning's simulation of blindness did not simulate this. And there is something else that his simulation did not simulate. It did not simulate knowing. He made, quote, wondrous discoveries every time out, end quote. Every time he ventured out with his new blindness, quote, a whole new way of knowing the world was opening up to me. And it was opening up to my ears, through my nose, through my feet, through my pores, end quote. For Manning, quote, light and shadows took on physical dimensions, end quote he began to appreciate the, quote, Doppler effect of sound. This new auditory horizon that gives much closer, the world much smaller, end quote. Only sounds such as jet planes cruising high in the atmosphere expanded Manning's world, quote, to anywhere near its former infinity, end quote. And this new experience of blindness, this new way of knowing the world, taught Manning that, quote, in the absence of the vastness, that visual feast, I, I came to recognize the overwhelming distraction that sight had been, end quote. Through blindness, Manning learned that sight had been a distraction, one that had prevented him from experiencing many wondrous aspects of the world. Simulation did not teach him this. It did not teach him, quote, the smells, oh good God, the smells, end quote. Only blindness taught him this. And quote, who knew such sensory lushness existed in this more immediate realm? Blind people knew. Blind people had to have known all along, end quote. The simulation of blindness, whether that of the hashtag How I See It campaign or of Lynn Manning is not, and this is almost too obvious to mention, blindness, sorry. Simulation is not the object of its own activity. And yet, in this age of the simulacrum, as Jean Baudrillard tells us, that simulation is not the same as not so obvious an observation. If doing things under blindfold is not actually being blind,
It certainly does give us, the sighted person, a real good idea of what's it like to be blind. This is the logic of simulation. An image of blindness is as good as blindness itself. This logic is, of course, possible only when blindness is understood as the lack of sight, as embodied by a sighted person with the sight missing. And there are many ways to eliminate sight, goes the logic of simulation. Plus disease, flawed genes, and of course, blindfolds. But what of this new way of knowing the world and these wondrous discoveries of which Lynn Manning speaks? What do we make of his claim that blind people know and had to have known all along? After all, Manning does speak of knowing the world from the point of view of blindness, even though this knowing may be new. And he does speak of wondrous discoveries, of aspects of that world known through blindness. But what sort of knowing is this? And what sorts of discoveries are they? This new and wondrous way of being in the world set is for Manning a beginning a beginning to the never-ending journey of understanding. And it is the beginning of being alive in and to the world. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. You're going to do what? Yes, we have 15 minutes for questions before lunch. Okay, that would be great. Uh, if you wouldn't mind saying your name. Uh, David Mitchell. <laughs> the, uh, one of the things I was thinking about across the panel is how much work goes into not finding out what blindness might offer as an alternative. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's an enormous amount of labor in containing blindness into something that can't yield any alternative knowledge whatsoever, but that's like part of the point as I'm thinking about it uh, now. And uh, so I just offer that observation and ask for perhaps some comments about the labor that has to be undergone in order to prevent one from coming up with an understanding of that alternative potential. I have the little mic here. Uh, is this, oh, that doesn't mic us. Thanks, David. I, I, um, it, it, is, it is an incredible amount of labor we exert into uh, showing just how, how uh, not only blindness but all sorts of things generates, uh, you know, nothing, nothing particularly good, let alone useful. And, and I can imagine that, you know, uh, kind of logic applying to so many of, uh, of the uh, activities and people we have in the world that are considered sometimes as not normal shape you want to use for that. Um, I, think, I think though that if I spend time as a sighted person thinking about what blindness, something good about blindness, then I'm, I'm, um, I'm kind of getting a little risky with my own sight. Uh, and I think that that's one of, the, one of the possibilities. If I think that something is particularly good, it may, it may just lead me to, to wonder like, well, why don't I try to get me some of that? <laughs> and, uh, and that's a rough thing to do with, with eyesight. You know, it's the same thing as um, uh, people talk about experimenting with all sorts of things, you know, sexuality and so on. Um, and sometimes that gets a little, a little risky and dangerous for people. So I'm not sure that many of us are prepared for that danger. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Got you? No, I, I, don't, I missed the question. I was doing mic things. Oh. Do you want to say anything or just ask no. one more question? I think that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm bringing the mic to you. Sure. Um, my name is Annalise Ferris. So I'm very early in the stages of compiling readings for my 
dissertation, which is looking at um, disability <coughs> and virtual embodiment in science fiction. Wow. So cyberpunk and virtual reality literature and all those sorts of things. But what I haven't found yet, and you're, all of you guys made me think that I need to look up text on simulation. So I was just wondering if you had recommendations for just like someone who is just thinking about these terms and uh, simu simulation and disability and where I should go. Hmm. Simulation and disability. Wow. <laughs> I, I think there's been a lot of critique of it. Uh, right. Yeah. I'll think about that while Devin answers. Yes, yeah, it sounds like a great project, <laughs> and at least, uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, in terms of simulation and, and text on it, I think one thing that would be important to look at is perhaps not the sighted perception of, oh, this must be blindness, and now I'm going to uh, narrate this through a story and produce some sort of knowledge for everybody else, but maybe to look at um, blind authors and blind writings on on just that blindness and you know, when that, when you're looking at that type of literature, simulation often just comes up. It's, it's there. Um, I think a lot of the time, blind people will simulate sight, too. So simulation is in there, as, as I tried to do by standing far from the mic, thinking that I could, you know, it, it's all there. Um, but, but I wouldn't so much, perhaps, focus on writings of sighted people through their their simulation of blindness because I just don't know if the knowledge that's generated from that is a knowledge um, that I would feel worth spreading or talking about. <laughs> but that's my perception of that. <laughs> uh, one uh, scholar I used who is cited, uh, but Anishinaabe scholar, indigenous scholar, uh, Gerald Weisner, and he wrote a book called uh, hmm, Survivance, I think. It's published 2008. He talks about si uh, how the native person has been made to simulate nativeness um, and critiques that uh, through uh, Baudrillard. So that's who influenced me today. Uh, so I, th I think it would be people who have a denaturalized sense mm. of the capacity of, of bodily capacities is where we'd have to go with um, thinking through simulation. Because there's some critiques of simulation that say, oh, you just don't do it well enough or um, that there's something actually to be learned from the fact that uh, an impairment, you can have a sensory experience of an impairment. So I, uh, as if the capacity lies in the impairment itself or the inability itself or uh, some restriction itself. And instead of saying, well, what is our naturalized relationship to embodiment that has led us into um, um, how do we use the naturalization of embodiment to enact power relations? Hmm. Rod, do you want to say anything? No, I, I just one comment, though. Um, let me just, uh, what led me actually think about more about simulating blindness was uh, at the University of Toronto, where I was teaching, uh, somebody from uh, some, someplace called Human Resources came to me and said that they were running simulation of disability uh, uh, workshops for all their faculty and staff so that the faculty and staff be more sensitive to people like me. And she wanted to know if I wanted to take part. Well, what they had done with blindness, so they had this great big huge room, a gymnasium, and, and there was like different disabilities in different, <laughs> different corners of the place. But what they did with blindness is they got eight-sided people and they sat on the floor and, uh, and, and the facilitator passed around now, maybe for you people from the UK, uh, you don't know what this is, a hockey puck? Do you know what that is? <laughs> they seem to maybe know. It's like a big know. biscuit. It looks like a <laughs> chocolate biscuit. Dark. Anyway, they pass this thing around with the, the people have blindfolds on, and they passed it around. The facilitator got them passed around to see if they could identify that object. And that was their, that was their simulation of blindness. And I, I remember saying to the group, I mean, that's, that's funny, as I've got many, many blind friends, and when we sit around, it never, ever occurred to me or to any one of us to pass around a hockey puck, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think next time. <laughs> it's funny stuff. Uh, question? I'm bringing the mic over to you. Oh, Catherine Hello, I'm Catherine Zuckel. Um, I'm banging around in my head for a same question about what, stim and I get it wrong, what stimulates people to simulate, what makes people want to do the simulation. And I was thinking, 
for asking a lot of money in simulation. You know, now you can watch a video that shows you what it's like to experience being autistic. You can put on a headset, so somebody spent a lot of time and effort in recreating that, that experience of simulating that experience. And it seems to me that it, it's an attempt to homogenize the experience, it's an attempt to contain difference. A bit like, um, you know, Rebecca and I, Rebecca and I wrote about the urge to know impairment. So I hope you don't mind me asking, but what's the matter with you? And then it will give you some kind of certainty, knowledge, power. Is that what's the driving the, the stimulant? Mm. <laughs> what's stimulating the desire to stimulate? I can't say that. Yeah, it's a <laughs> tongue tie <laughs> riddle there. Say it five times fast. So is it something to do with power? Mm. Thanks, Catherine. Coming back with the mic. Devin? Sure. Um, hi, Catherine. Lovely to see you. Um, I, I think it does, because oftentimes, um, at, I'll use an example from the University of Toronto. If I go as a blind student to say, okay, I need accessibility, and, I, and I'd like to discuss perhaps the different ways in which that could um, manifest, they look at me and say, oh, well, we already know what you need because we've done these simulations with a hockey puck, so we know already what this blind student needs and we're prepared and ready so you will never catch us off guard. Um, and don't even bother speaking blindness because we already know what you have to say. And I think that it, in that moment of um, interaction, that is what I think um, stimulates simulation, is that please don't, Please don't speak. I, I already know what's going on. I, I'm the knowing power. Sight becomes the knowing power of blindness. Able-bodiedness becomes the knowing power of how to get around a building in a wheelchair. Um, I, I think it, it is that sense of transcending. I don't need to talk to you. I, I already know. We're prepared. So there's, there's almost that kind of protection of you'll never catch me off guard, I think, perhaps. Right? Well, I just, yeah. You know. I, uh, thanks, Catherine. Well, I do think it's, uh, it's like, as I was uh, trying to try and say in not a very articulate way, but if, if we're going to simulate anything, we can't have the it, you know, like the dissimulation that Baudrillard talked about and Tanya's talk. Um, but I think we have to, we don't, I mean, we, we don't simulate everything, you know, mm -hmm. clearly. I mean, we don't go, it's not a random activity. It's a very pointed, selective activity. So we'll simulate things that are important to us. And there is some sense of preparation. I mean, dress rehearsal in a play in theater, is simulating the opening night, for instance, the live performance. So there's all sorts of things like that. You know, there's, there's, there's sports has that in, in, um, in practice and in all sorts of other practices for activities. And, uh, but the, the, the autism thing or the, or the gaining of what it's like to be autistic by putting on headphones, it's a really funny activity because it's, I mean, it's suggesting there's not enough autistic people in the world to go around. So in case you don't bump into one, yeah. we'll give you some headphones. You know, and yeah. you check it out. Then you won't have to bump into one. So you mm -hmm. check off autism. You know, and they mm -hmm. go on to something else. But it's a, uh, it does suggest that you may not bump into an autistic person. Mm -hmm. That's funny. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm taking the mic over to the side here. guiding me along the road because he would be an area better than me and I didn't know whether I was going to end up falling down some steps or what <laughs> so yeah that's a different take because often you know the circumstances particularly in the dark and if I'm in a strange area it's like I'm blind <laughs> mm. Mm. That raises the question of what is guiding us, or even as we're making um, decisions in our course outlines or in our dissertation, what we're going to read in our dissertation. Like uh, the question of what's guiding us is a is a good question. 
And we must, I guess in some ways, we're all like simulating some version of what we think counts as a worthwhile version of disability. And I, I, I suppose it's in gatherings like this where we get to reconsider, well, what, what version of disability is guiding us? Yeah, Antonio, so I see your hand. Oh, I didn't ask the panel. Would you like to respond to that? I'm good. I'm going towards Antonio's. Uh, this is Antonius from the University of Sepi. Thanks all of you three for these fascinating papers. And what I really enjoyed across all papers was the detailed discussion of the transition from a charitable model, which functioned complementary to welfare state and was based on the politics of pity, to uh, fundraising campaigns which contribute to neoliberalism aims, to, pro to naturalize certain forms of embodiment, and uh, reproducing eugenic discourses. My question, though, is about the fascination of simulation. So besides simulations being a source of knowledge, of a diminutive uh, source of knowledge, they are also seen as a source of fascination, and they are veiled into a playful kind of nature, which people are supposed to enjoy as well. And these seeds, next to the fear that you were all describing as well, and the naturalization of sightness. So what do you think of that? Thanks, Antonius. Mm -hmm. I, I realize I've missed some other people who wanted to question. So maybe we'll take two more questions, and then the panel could respond. Great. Uh, there, apparently, there was someone back here. Yes, I'm coming towards you. <laughs> I'm handing you the mic. In the back, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Sherry Wells Jensen, and as someone who raged against how I say it campaign oh, um, yay. endlessly, um, I just want to thank you all for your advocacy <laughs> for that because that was that was a terrible time, and I think it did profound damage to a lot of good people. Um, my question is this: simulation is really a good drug, and I think it's <laughs> fast, it's cheap. And everybody afterwards seems like they had a really good time and they had kind of a moment and you bring the group together and everybody feels beautiful. It really yes. is a good drug. <laughs> and so my question is, how do we take academic discourse like this, which is truth and is meaningful, and work it into, I don't want to say weapon, but I will, a weapon to destroy this thing which I think is damaging all our communities in profound ways. Is there something we can replace this with? Or um, is there a way of destroying this beast? Wow. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question and back to the panel, and that will be the day. And uh, oh, this was. Thank you. How to destroy simulation? Okay. Um, I just, in response to Catherine's question about, like, well, if, obviously your panel's question, what stimulates simulation? I was also thinking from the perspective of someone who doesn't have any kind of disability. Um, I think there is a real, um, my perception is that people have a real lack of understanding about what disability is because we have such a lack of representation of disability in our, in our culture, like in, a, in television shows and in books and in such like, there's, we, we have such a lack of representation of what it is and people actually have a desire to learn more about it and because people have a fear of when you meet someone with a disability, you don't know how to respond and so it shuts people down. So I think some of it actually does come from a place of like a genuine desire to learn and to create empathy and to know more. And so clearly like there is some really problematic stuff involved, but I think, yeah, if we can find a way to really harness that genuine desire to, to, to learn more and do good, how could we do that, I guess? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I'm coming with the mic towards okay. the panel table. Whoopsie, sorry. I don't want to just Yeah. And uh, Brad, would you like the mic yeah, first? Yeah, just really quick. Okay, and we have about two or three minutes. Okay, thanks so much. Um, the first question about the weapon and what we can do. Um, I've retired, so I'm not doing anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you people, okay? Uh, the one about uh, it's a genuine uh, uh, wanting as a way of, of knowing and stuff. I think there's some truth to that. I think, though, uh, because it's a question of a genuine urge to know, that urge is answered immediately by simulation. I mean, if you want to know, think it through a little bit. You know, it's like there's a pamphlet at the University of Toronto that says what to do when you meet a blind person. Yeah. 
Now put yourself in a position of that no one will come up to you until they've had training. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just weird. You know? yeah. <laughs> like take a shot, take a chance, take a risk. Then I think that's, that's what we should do. You don't need to say anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and just off that, I think that there is that we all have a genuine um, need to connect and to interact and, and to know. But I think to, to take that genuine need and not approach it um, as an object to be studied, like, ah, blindness is out there and I would like to know it. Um, anything that's simulated, it's transformed into an it. And it's an it that you are trying to acquire and get at. Um, and I think if you kind of step back a bit and say, hmm, okay, and, and this might get to your answer of how do we um, move away from simulation and the knowledge that it produces, how do we destroy that, is to stop approaching different ways of being in the world as an it and um, start interacting. Uh, I think that, that that is the main thing. If you have a genuine curiosity of blindness, then perhaps check out some blind people. <laughs> Go for a coffee. I, I know that sounds silly, but I, I think it is a fundamental switch between not itifying people. Itifying. You know, that, like that. yeah, that, that, I think that's how we destroy simulation, because we won't need it anymore. <coughs> Yeah, or I feel that we need it. Oh, mm, I just okay. wanted to correct that. Yeah, I, I think the urge to know, uh, the, the genuine urge to know, has demonstrated that it's a pretty dangerous urge, oftentimes. And our way, uh, the desire to know, has come with some pretty deadly consequences. So I, I think um, that's connected to the weaponry. Uh, we need to examine our urges to know. And, and the way we think we're coming to gain knowledge about, about disability. I think that's the gift of disability studies. It is, allows us to do that in all the uh, different disciplines. To, how, is, how have we wanted to know disability should be an, a question through which we could dismantle the ways we've wanted to know disability, which I think relates to Antonio's point um, of the deadly ends of knowledge uh, we have a lot of knowledge that has been committed to producing the, the ends of some people and transforming them into its or objectifi objectification as a problem of colonization and most of our ways of, of knowing. I think that's how I'd answer that. I really enjoyed being here with um, Me too. Rod and Devin and all of you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.